This video is going to discuss how to apply the central limit theorem. Uh, it kind of begs the question, why not immediately? Did you show us something that's not true? Uh, the answer is no, but there's some complication to immediately using the central limit theorem. It's going to involve the calculation of the standard error of the sample mean. That should be implicit, but in case it's not, let's write it in. So there's going to be a little bit to be said about using the standard error in application. And to do the central limit theorem, to use the central limit theorem in applied problems, we need to take account into account the standard error in that application. And that's inevitably going to push us for crazy statistical reasons into this. I think this will be the second to last. This is the penultimate named distribution in this class. I believe this is the second to last distribution that we will name and identify in this class, the T distribution. We're going to go into some R. We're going to try to do some fancy plotting surrounding the T distribution to give you a better sense of what it looks like. I'm not even going to try to draw it in, uh, in this whiteboard space that I'm talking about. And then I'll try to show you some new functions in R that will help you understand the difference more concretely, I hope. We'll see. So the central limit theorem, uh, so I'm going to start out by addressing this why not immediately. The central limit theorem tells us as sample size increases, the sampling distribution of the sample mean that is if if we even though it never happens if we repeatedly sampled from the population and from each new sample we calculated a new sample mean and then we made a density plot of those sample means according to the central limit theorem that density plot of sample means would be called the sampling distribution of the sample mean and the shape, the sampling distribution of the sample mean, is approximately normal. The central limit theorem tells us as the sample size increases, the sampling distribution of the sample mean is approximately normal with mean mu, that is, it will be centered at the value you're actually trying to estimate. So that's good. You will estimate accurately the thing you're hoping to estimate, the population mean mu. And standard deviation sigma over the square root of n. Let's see if we can rewrite that a little bit cleaner. They actually call the standard deviation Can I not spell right now? Standard, here we go. Deviation sigma over the square root of n, where the square root of n uh, is the square root of your sample size, where n is your sample size. We actually call this the standard error of sample mean. Now, herein lies the issue of the central limit theorem. Notice we are trying to estimate the population parameter mean mu. Well, we get a sampling distribution that's centered at the mean, so that's excellent. But the standard deviation of this sampling distribution involves another population parameter, which we don't know. And that's why we immediately cannot apply, we cannot immediately apply the central limit theorem. Because we don't know the population standard deviation, we can't describe the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the sample mean. Because we don't know these population parameters, we don't know the population mean, we don't know the population standard deviation, 
we can't immediately say what the average squared width is of the sampling distribution of the sample mean. So here we are in this twist of fate where we have this grand theorem that tells us the shape of the sampling distribution of the sample mean. It gives us the average squared width, which we call the standard error of the sample mean. But the problem is sigma over the square root of n is a population parameter. That is, it is a quantity that is unknown because sigma is unknown. So what we need to do is figure out a way to estimate the population standard error. Lucky for us, S is the letter whoops, of choice for the sample standard deviation. Well, your book Biostat is going to use S. I'm going to use sigma hat, but I don't actually care which letter you use. Either way, we should be able to get by this understanding of sigma hat over the square root of n or S over the square root of n is the sample standard error. So this is the quantity, whichever notation you want to use, that we are going to describe the width of the sampling distribution of the sample mean. This quantity is what we're going to do. Lucky for us, to estimate the sample standard deviation, all we have to do is call the function SD on some vector. As long as we call SD on some vector, then we get out the sample standard deviation. I will show us an example of that after we discuss the next step in applying the central limit theorem. The next step in applying the central limit theorem is recognizing that our goal in statistics is inherently to estimate differences between groups. Most often, the world of statistics quantifies the differences between groups as the differences between the group's means. So we're inherently trying to estimate sample uh, population means using sample means. Well, what we've just found out is that the central limit theorem describes the shape of the distribution of the sample mean, and the shape depends on a population parameter. So here we are trying to estimate a population mean. In order to do so, it depends on another population parameter. We get around that fact by estimating that other population parameter using the sample standard deviation. But now, in order to make a statement about the one population parameter, the mean, we have to estimate two population quantities. Because we have to estimate two population quantities, our uncertainty is increasing. In order to account for the increased uncertainty, the central limit theorem magically turns into this T distribution. So we're going to describe the t-distribution simply by what it provides for us in the world of statistics. The t-distribution accounts for added uncertainty in estimating a population mean 
mu due to having to simultaneously estimate the population standard deviation. So a good note is the T distribution accounts for, I'm just going to summarize, accounts for estimating two population parameters. When we're trying to only make statements about the population mean. So what we should imagine in our heads is that the T distribution is somehow wider than the normal distribution, accounting for the added uncertainty of having to estimate two population parameters should theoretically make our distributions wider. Uncertainty in the world of statistics is generally captured by width of these distributions. Now remember, all these distributions are going to have area under the curve equal to one. So if we make a distribution wider, it simultaneously has to be shorter. Remember that when we get to these plots, that a wider distribution has to be shorter, such that the area under the curve still equals 1. So let's make a few general statements about the t-distribution before we go and look at some pictures. The T distribution has an added parameter named degrees of freedom. And often we just call it DF. When estimating the degrees of freedom, no, when estimating a single mean, the degrees of freedom are equal to the sample size minus one. So we're going to start out with some examples this week of estimating single means. And for all the examples, our degrees of freedom will be our sample size minus one. That minus one is to account for the fact that we have to estimate an extra parameter in order to discuss the things it is we are interested in estimating, like the mean. T distribution has fat tails governed by the degrees of freedom as whoops, the degrees of freedom go up the tails of the t distribution shrink specifically the tails of the t distribution shrink towards the normal distribution. So there's really two ideas going on here. The T distribution has fat tails, relatively fatter tails than the normal distribution. But as your degrees of freedom go up, that is as your sample size goes up, then the tails of the T distribution will slowly work their way down, become skinnier, skinnier, skinnier until they resemble the normal distribution. That's essentially saying if your sample size goes all the way up to infinity, theoretically, then um, your T distribution has such little uncertainty in it that you come all the way back to the central limit theorem. If your sample size goes off to infinity, then you know all the population parameters because you've collected every piece of information there is. 
And if you have all the information there is, then you can estimate population parameters exactly. And if you can estimate population parameters exactly, then the central limit theorem holds. That is, you can estimate the population standard deviation. So I'm going to jump into R, and I'm going to make us some plots that show us the normal distribution and the multiple t distributions that you could have depending on your degrees of freedom. So I'm going to make multiple plots on one page. They will vary by the degrees of freedom, and as the degrees of freedom go up, you will see the tails shrink towards the normal distribution. Let's give this a shot. This is going to be some advanced plotting, no doubt. If all you want to do is watch and see the images that we create, that's totally fine with me. On the other hand, if you think this plot looks cool and you want to show off to your friends, because all your friends will think you're the coolest if you can make this plot, then by all means, put it into your course notes. But I'm not going to require it in your course notes. So I'm going to create a data frame that's just going to keep one column of two values, x, that's going to hold values negative 4 to positive 4. We're going to center all of our normal and multiple t distributions at 0. And the plot is going to extend from negative 4 to positive 4. And there's a quick way to cheat that in R by just saying the two bounds of the plot here. So we're going to use ggplot with our data frame that we just created. And we're going to put x, our numeric variable, on the x-axis as we are wont to do for density plots. Now, technically, I'm not actually making density plots because I'm going to use the actual distributions themselves instead of random sampling. But that's OK. Everything should work out. We'll start with the density of the normal distribution. So our function we're going to use is dnorm. You don't fully have to understand all the details behind this. It should just work out for us. And we're going to specify that in the aesthetic, we want the color of, let's just say, OK, this is going to be a little weird. We want the color equal to the string normal. Now, what we're going to be able to do later on is say, paint the normal things black or whatever color we choose. So let's just start there and see how it goes. Don't worry that the colors don't match. What, uh, what you might want. Like normally we see black lines showing up. What we're really interested in here is that here is the shape of the normal distribution with relatively skinny tails, even though that's hard to see. And the key piece that we wanted out of specifying the normal word for the color is right here. Normal shows up relative to the line color of choice. So there is our first starting point for our plot, where you draw the normal distribution. And if we just, OK, here's a trick. If you put your cursor on a new line within the console and just hit up, it will bring back the entire line of code from before that you had. So I'm just going to add a plus to that line of code and then hit Enter. And instead of giving me a new greater than symbol, it gives me a plus to say, you're trying to add more things to this. Why don't you just add them now, and I'll go ahead and deal with it appropriately. So last time we used the density d of the normal distribution, but now we're going to use the density of the t distribution. We're going to have to specify the degrees of freedom, and I'm just going to start with 1. That will give me the fattest possible tails for the t distribution. And in AES, I'm going to say color equals t underscore 1 for t distribution with one degree of freedom. If you want to do t space 1 or whatever you want on t1, I don't care what you say, say in there. OK, let's just hit Enter and see what we get. We get two line, two curves. We can see now that this pinkish one, which is not my ideal choice, is named normal. And it's much taller and has skinnier tails because the normal distribution has relatively skinny tails. Because it has skinny tails but needs area under the curve equal to 1, it must be taller. 
symmetrically, the t distribution with one degree of freedom must be shorter because it has fatter tails. Look how much wider, taller, really, those tails are on the t distribution. That's our first example of the t distribution. It's shorter because it has fatter, we say, tails. Really, they're taller tails, but the word we use in statistics is fatter. So watch this. I'm going to go back to the console. I'm going to hit up twice to bring back the very start of my plot for the normal distribution. As long as my line ends with plus, it will give me the plus sign such that I can add up twice here a new layer to my plot. So I'm going to add that same layer we did before. I'm going to put a plus after it because I want to add a few more layers. I'm going to bring that same thing back, but now I'm just going to change the degrees of freedom to, I don't know, three. I'm going to leave that plus there because I want to just keep adding new layers. I don't know, five degrees of freedom. And let's do one more where we get, I don't know, crazy, 20. And this time I'm going to keep the plus, but the last layer I'm going to add is this weird word named scale color manual with underscores in between the distinct words. The first argument to this function is going to be the title to our legend. So I'm going to name our legend distributions instead of color spelled with a U, which is the uh, New Zealand strategy. It's actually the British spelling of it, but the guy who wrote the ggplot package is actually from New Zealand with his British spellings. He happens to now live in Texas, so I've always wondered if his uh, uh, accents have like merged in any way. I've never heard him speak, but I'd really like to, to hear this British New Zealand sort of Texas accent. I hope it's as fun as I imagine. Okay, and then the values are going to be the colors we actually want to specify for the different plots. So here you're going to see me struggle through coming up with distinct colors for the normal distribution, the t distribution on one degree of freedom, the t distribution with two with three degrees of freedom, the t distribution with five degrees of freedom, and the t distribution with 20 degrees of freedom. I'm going to start with black, and then I'm going to say blue, and then orange, and then gray, and then I'm gonna check. How many do I actually need? One, two, three, four, five, and I have black, blue, orange, gray. Okay, well, I guess I'm gonna go green, and then gray. And then I'm not going to have any pluses after this. I'm gonna ensure all my parent right parentheses match up with my left parentheses. They appear to. And in the end, I'm going to get this amazing plot that looks like this. This is the complex plot I wanted to create for representing the normal distribution, the tallest distribution in black, because it has relatively the thinnest tails. Then down from there is the T distribution on 20 degrees of freedom. 20 is the largest degrees of freedom we have for any of these t distributions, so it's the next tallest after the normal distribution. That is to say, the t distribution with more degrees of freedom is closer to the normal distribution than are any of the other t distributions. And look, the height here in the center matches the um, narrowness, the small, the shortness of the tails close to the normal distribution on both sides, because these are symmetric distributions. Uh, let's see, next in line is the T on five degrees of freedom. So that would be normal T20, T5, this gray one here, which is hard to see. Maybe my color choices weren't excellent, but as you could see, you could pick your own color choices. And then down here is going to be the T on three degrees of freedom. And you can see the tails are yet a little bit fatter. All the way down to the T on one degree of freedom, that's the fattest tailed T distribution you can come up with. And you can see here that the tails are in fact taller, fatter than any other distribution we have plotted. This plot here might not seem that incredible to you. 
in that those distributions all look pretty much the same. Maybe you're thinking that. Well, here I'm going to show you some code in R to show you just how different these T distributions are. I'm going to focus specifically on the normal and the T distribution with one degree of freedom. So what we could do is use a function named QNorm, that is for quantiles of the normal distribution. And we could pass into it, let's just say 0 0.98. So the 98th percentile of the normal distribution or the 98th quantile of the normal distribution happens at value 2.05. So really, if you went down to this number two and on the black curve, which represents the normal distribution, all the area to the left of this number two, all the way off to negative infinity under this black curve, is 98% of the area underneath the black curve, the normal distribution. So the value 2.05 here, 2 0.05, gives us 98% of the area to the left of this number beneath the black curve. Okay, here we go. Let's get a little bit more fancy. We could plug in 0 0.1 and 0 0.9. So that's saying the 10th percentile of the normal distribution is negative 1.28. So maybe somewhere around here. It's like one and a half. Yeah, somewhere around here. No, that's one. This is like one point to eight, like somewhere there. So from here to the left is about 10% of the area under the normal distribution. And similarly for the 90th percentile up at about here. Now, the reason I picked out these two numbers is really because between to the right of the 10th percentile and to the left of the 90th percentile in between those two numbers is about 80% of the distribution. So you can imagine in between negative 1.28 and positive 1.28 is about 80% of the distribution. Okay, let's try one more example. If we picked 0 point, point 0.025 and 0.975, that's saying in between basically negative 2 and positive 2 is about 95% of the area under the normal distribution. We could use a similar function named QT as long as we specify the degrees of freedom equal to 1. And we could find that under the blue curve, that is the T distribution with one degree of freedom, in order to capture 95% of the area, we actually need to go all the way out to negative 12 and up to positive 12. So not just negative 2 to positive 2, but in fact much further to the right and much further to the left in order to capture 95% of the distribution. That's almost like a six times difference, a six a uh, factor wider on the T distribution with one degree of freedom in order to capture the same amount of probability between these two numbers. Okay, if that's not striking enough to you, let's do one more crazy example. We'll start with the normal distribution and we'll go out to 0 0.01 and up to 0 0.9. In order to capture no, you know what? Let's do, I like the number 99. In order to capture 95% of the area underneath the normal curve, that is the black curve, we need to go out to negative 2.6 and up to positive 2.6. So really within the frame of reference here, under the black curve, the normal distribution, we can capture 99% of the area. Okay, let's try the same idea. For the, nor for the T distribution on one degree of freedom. Before you guys hit enter here, you should just take a guess. How wide do you need to go? Do you think it's a factor of six? Oh, no, no, no. It is much wider. In order to capture 99% of the area under the fattest tailed T distribution possible, you need to go out to negative 60, it's almost negative 64, and all the way up to positive 64. 
That right there should help you understand how much wider the T distribution is. The T distribution is there to capture the added uncertainty of having to estimate the population standard deviation within the calculation of the standard error while you are intending to estimate the population mean. Now remember, if you had a vector of 1,001 data points named x, it's really easy to calculate the mean and really easy to calculate the sample standard deviation. And hence, you could really easily calculate the sample standard error. I haven't paid too much attention to the formulas uh, that I wrote down earlier in the notes because this quick example right here shows you for any vector, whether it comes from some data frame or not, it's really easy to calculate the standard error of the sample mean using a sample standard deviation.